so good afternoon to all and everyone myself baleshwar from this department you all are welcome once again in today's lecture that is jl mehta lecture series on culture and civilization under the celebration of azadi ka amrit mahotsav the topic of today's lecture is the idea of swaraj professor paneer selvam will deliver the lecture and professor dn tiwari sir will preside over the session so before the formal start of this session i would like to the boost of honorable founder of our university pandit madan mohan malviya ji so in this series i would like to request our head professor anand mishra sir to felicitate today's guest with sol and uh, offering garlands He is Professor Paneer Selvam. And we all know Professor D. N. Tiwari, sir. He has been former head of the Department of Philosophy and Religion. and now i invite uh, professor anand mishra sir for uh, formal welcome of the speaker and the gathering hari yo ऑनरेबल चेयरपर्सन प्रोफेसर डी एन तिवारी जी अवर स्पीकर प्रोफेसर पनीर सेल्वम कन्वीनर डॉक्टर बालेश्वर प्रसाद यादव जी प्रोफेसर पी आर भट्ट सर प्रोफेसर सतीश दुबे जी प्रोफेसर ज्योत्ना श्रीवास्तव जी प्रोफेसर आलोक और अदर कलीग्स स्टूडेंट्स प्रोफेसर जीपी दास सर प्रोफेसर उमा चट्टोपाध्याय एंड सो मेनी अदर स्कॉलर्स कनेक्टेड टू द जवाहरलाल मेहता लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन कल्चर एंड सिविलाइजेशन आई ऑन on behalf of the department of philosophy and religion 
extend a warm welcome to all of you. Friends, as I had told you in the earlier session, we are just today concluding the lecture series which we have been having for last at least 20 months. In fact, we organized a number of lectures, lectures under Radha Krishnan lecture series on philosophy and religion, TRB Murthy lecture series on Buddhism, and uh, now we are going to have a lecture in Jalau Lal Mehta lecture series on culture and civilization. All these great scholars were associated with this department. That's why we floated these lecture series. Our proposal was granted by ICPR, then IOE BHU also, in fact, sponsored the lectures. So I formally thank these two, ICPR and IOE BHU. Due to them, actually, we have been organizing these various lectures. Today, Professor Paneer Silvam would deliver his talk on the idea of Swaraj. In fact, uh, all of you are well aware of Swaraj in ideas of K.C. Bhattacharya and then different uh, works on Swaraj. In fact, Swaraj was the key term for our freedom struggle. Still, we have so many parties claiming for real Swaraj in the land. So it would be very interesting to see how Professor Paneer Selvam speaks on this particular theme. He has been engaged with hermeneutics, the problem of understanding between culture and culture, cross-cultural studies, intercultural studies have been his prime concern. So we would be really benefited by his lecture. I welcome again Professor Paneer, welcome Paneer Silvam sir. I welcome Professor D. N. Tiwari sir who is presiding the lecture. I also welcome all other guests, scholars, colleagues who are present here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It has been the tradition of our department to introduce the speaker to the audience. So before formally invite Professor Paneer Selvam, I would like to put before you his compact bio note before you. So, Professor Dr. A. S. Paneer Selvam, former National Fellow, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, former chairman, School of Philosophy and Religious Thought, and professor and head, Department of Philosophy, University of Madras, has authored and edited 18 books and also published more than 90 research papers in the leading philosophical journals and anthologies at national and international levels. He has participated in more than 300 national and international conferences and seminars in many countries in uh, connection with the international conferences and invited lectures. Paneer Selvam's field of specialization include Indian philosophical traditions, intercultural philosophy, postmodernism, hermeneutics, contemporary uh, continental, contemporary continental philosophy, 
and Tamil philosophical tradition. He was selected by Indo-Canadian Sastri Institute and the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade Canada under faculty in uh, enrichment program later as adjunct professor at Concordia University, Canada. He was also nominated by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, in the frame of the Indo-French cooperation in social sciences for a research work at Paris for a month. Professor A. S. Paneer Selvam is advisory committee member of the Satya Nilayam Chennai and uh, that is Journal of Intel, Intercultural Philosophy and also the associate editor of Suvidya Journal. He was also visiting professor of Indian Council of Philosophical Research and Department of Philosophy, JNU New Delhi. He is also the member of Editorial Board Philosophy, Journal of North Bengal University, Jaipur Philosophy Department, Journal and Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi that is JICPR. He has been the visiting professor of the American University of Sovereign National USA and at Kumamoto University, Japan and founder secretary of Chennai Philosophical Forum and also presently general secretary of the Indian Philosophical Congress. So this is a very compendium bio note of, uh, note of Professor Paneer Selvam. Now it is time for him to come here and deliver his talk. So, Professor Paneer, sir, please come. Most respected <coughs> Professor Anand Mishaji, the head of the Department of Philosophy, PHU, my good friend Professor Ian Tiwariji, Professor P. R. Bhatt, Professor Baleshwar Yadav, <coughs> Professor Joshna Srivatsa, Professor Alok, and my respected colleagues and students of this department, and those who have joined this lecture by online, especially my good friend, Professor G.P. Das, Dr. Alok Tendon, and other friends. At the outset, I'm grateful to this department, especially to Professor Anand Mishraji, for, uh, first of all, tolerating me for all these uh, months, I should say, because he has extended the, the invitation in last year, that is August 2022, but I have been somehow postponing, postponing this program. And uh, two weeks ago also, I told him that uh, if you could postpone it to the end of this month, I would be happy. But he said nothing doing because we are going to wind up this. Either you come or we'll drop the program. So I thought that I should visit the department for two reasons. One is great salwars have taught this department. We have been very much benefited by their teachings. And also I would like to have the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath. In fact, I told Anandji that I'll visit your department on one condition that you should make, a, a, you know, a provision for me to visit Kashi Vishwanath temple and uh, he said definitely you will visit the temple and you will have the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath. So I am here. Uh, friends, uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, lecture is Jail Mehta lecture. Some of you are aware of the name Jail Mehta because he is the one who is specialized in Heidegger's philosophy as well as in the field of Indian hermeneutics. In fact, Heidegger said 
that it is Jail Mehta who has understood his philosophy, that is Heidegger's philosophy, in a correct way. So Jail Mehta is a well-known scholar both in Indian and Western tradition. And moreover, a field of specialization is uh, not only Heidegger, but also hermeneutics. I'm also interested in hermeneutics. So I feel uh, uh, proud to talk about uh, the significance of uh, hermeneutics in the context of uh, Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj or the idea of Swaraj following the methodology which uh, Professor J.L. Mehta has offered in the context of hermeneutics. Uh, friends, what I would like to do is that <coughs> Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj or the idea of Swaraj is not only a political concept but also a philosophical concept or I would say that we can extend the scope of Swaraj to both the cultural as well as, as, well as a philosophical discourse. So what we can do is, we can contextualize the concept of Swaraj in the cultural and philosophical discourse and see how far it is helpful to us, how far it is uh, valid, or how far it is acceptable to us in the present philosophical context. So in this uh, approach, I would like to draw some parallels between Gandhi's uh, concept of Swaraj, that is really Gandhi's uh, understanding of Hind Swaraj, and uh, K.C. Bhattacharya's well-known article, Swaraj in Ideas. So what we need is now to reinterpret the concept of culture in the philosophical context. This means there is a need for us to revisit culture, which can give us a new dimension to the philosophical problems. It is not uh, my point to say that simply we have to cling on to culture. Because simply clinging on to culture without making any deviation or any, any revisit would take us to orthodoxy. I'm not supporting the notion of orthodoxy. On the other hand, I would like to state that there is a need for us, or I would say the urgent need for us to revisit the notion of culture and it has to be interpreted hermeneutically so that it can give new meaning to us. One can contextualize uh, in Swaraj or KCB's uh, Swaraj in ideas in philosophical discourse, especially the contemporary Indian philosophical discourse, and see whether there is something called Indianness in it. Because in the philosophy, quite often it is said that Indian philosophers have lost their direction. So whether there is something called Indianness in Indian philosophical discourses is very much essential. This is very much uh, important in the context of a uh, contemporary Indian philosophy. In the colonial India, we could see how the Western culture tried to invade Indian culture and to some extent they were also successful. One area of interference is the introduction of uh, English in Indian universities and colleges, which has been used as a medium of instruction. Hence, uh, this uh, linguistic division, that is English as well as non or English versus non-English, made us to write or rewrite some of our concepts in an alien language that is English. Whether to write it in our language 
or foreign language is very much uh, important. So it is wrongly assumed that writing in English is a progressive approach. The imitation, no doubt, has helped us to some extent, but also we have to take into account uh, the creativity of the individual or indigenous thinkers is lost by writing it in English. So Gandhi has used this concept of Swaraj in a broader perspective. I would like to quote Gandhi. He says, when I speak of cultural subjection, I do not mean the assimilation of an alien culture. That assimilation need not be an evil. It may be positively necessary for healthy progress. And in any case, it does not mean a lapse or freedom. So there is a cultural subjection only once traditional caste of ideas and sentiments is superseded without comparison or competition by a new caste represented, representing an alien culture. This is what uh, Subhijivan Bhattacharya says. Further, K.C. Bhattacharya says that slavery has entered in our every, in, in very soul. And his method of approach is something novel because he said, let us think uh, boldly in our own concepts, in our own terms. So which means we have to evolve a living culture suited to the times of our native genius. One can compare here K.C. Bhattacharya's uh, Swaraj in ideas with that of uh, Gandhi's uh, Hind Swaraj. In Swaraj is a revolutionary text, and similarly, Swaraj in ideas also a revolutionary text. So there can be many parallels which we can draw between Gandhi's idea of In Swaraj and the concept of Swaraj, which has been emphasized by K.C. Bhattacharya. In fact, in their 1984, the Indian Philosophical Quarterly, that is the department publication of Pune University, has brought out a special volume uh, on uh, KCB's uh, approach to Swaraj and Ideas. They say Swaraj and Ideas Revisited, wherein many scholars have contributed substantially for uh, re-understanding the concept of uh, Swaraj of uh, KCB. One article uh, is very fascinating. Of course, all articles are very fascinating. One article which I would like to mention here is S.S. Uh, Deshpande's, Professor Deshpande's, uh, a juxtaposition of uh, KCB and Gandhi. This was published in IPQ in the year 1984. And he makes a comparison between Gandhi and uh, KC Bhattacharya. And uh, there are two uh, parallels which uh, Professor Daesh Panda could uh, draw. I would like to quote him. There is no gainsaying the fact that this Western culture which means an entire system of ideas and sentiments has been simply imposed upon us. This is what the KCB says, according to Deshpande. Then Deshpande compares this with uh, Gandhi's understanding of Hind Swaraj. He says, this is passage from uh, Gandhi's uh, Hind Swaraj, carried away by the flood uh, of Western thought, we came to the conclusion that without weighing pros and cons, that we should give this kind of education to all the people. Further, Gandhi says that we want the English rule without the English man. You want the tiger's nature, but not the tiger. That is to say, you would make India English. This is not the Swaraj I want. This is what Gandhi says. There can be many parallels, just now I said, can be drawn between Swaraj and ideas of KCB and Gandhi's understanding of Swaraj. But it is fascinating to note uh, that how uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore reacted to Gandhi's understanding of uh, Swaraj. With uh, regard to Swaraj, he said that uh, there is a need for us to revisit uh, Gandhian approach of uh, Swaraj. And uh, there is an interesting debate between Gandhi and Tagore, uh, which clearly show that uh, the terms which have been used, that is Swaraj and Sudesi, 
do not have a common meaning for both these uh, uh, thinkers. The interpretation differs. So it is interesting to see how we can include KCB also in the context of uh, Swaraj, of uh, Gandhi, and the idea of Swaraj according to uh, Tagore. Tagore felt that uh, Gandhi's ideology is not only short-sighted, but also incoherent. In the concept of Swaraj, a political idea has to be drawn, and to have a political freedom, one can see how philosophers like KCB use this in the context of a cultural as well as, as, well as philosophical uh, text. The one interesting book I would like to mention, which was published in the year 1909, is Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule by Gandhi, wherein he discussed the notion of Swaraj, modern civilization and mechanism. Gandhi explains how the European civilization predominate everybody. Of course, this book was banned in the next year, that is 1910 by the British. So it is this book uh, is in the form of a dialogue a dialogue between the reader and the editor. And uh, three important points are discussed by Gandhi here. One is so home rule is a self-rule. Then Indian independence is only possible through passive resistance. And thirdly, India will never become free unless it rejects the Western civilization itself. Now, Gandhi felt uh, that modernity or modernism has created a lot of problems for India. And he argued that uh, modernity or modernism has promised many things, but it did not fulfill those things. For this reason, Gandhi wanted liberation from modernity itself. There is a colonial domination in modernity. And modernity, according to Gandhi, is a threat to India and its citizens. Why? Because the concept of uh, democracy, development, liberty, and individuality or individualism, all these are misrepresented by modernity, according to Gandhi. So there is a need for us to re-understand the notion of uh, modernity as it was explained by Gandhi and other thinkers. So Gandhi correctly understood that all those promises which have been given by modernity or modernism were wrong, totally wrong, and they are ill-founded. It came with good and bad, and the imaginary benefit which have been anticipated is not uh, ready. So Gandhi was right in saying that modernity, modernity and its nature is uh, immoral. And because of that, individual freedom is lost. So in fact, there are modern scholars like, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, Habermas and others who argue that uh, modernity is an unfinished project. Of course, many postmodernists argue that uh, Modernity could bring a uh, lot of uh, uh, ills. That is, uh, they, they could not solve many problems, as uh, Gandhi felt that there were, they gave a lot of promises, but uh, modernity could not fulfill those promises. So it has to be understood that modernity is both uh, the structure of power, it represents power, and also the mode of power. So as structure of power, it is an ideology bounded with Western domination and white democracy. As a mode of power, it is implemented by multiple actors and subjectivities that are hierarchically distributed, which uh, we can see dualism, such as Europe and others, West and the East, North and South, metropolis and the colonies. So this uh, demarcation very clearly shows this is how modernity promotes uh, his uh, own uh, uh, interests. In fact, uh, uh, Edward Said in his well-known book, uh, well book, Orientalism, talks about how there is a very clear-cut uh, uh, distinction between, uh, 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 I mean, uh, colonized and uh, uh, 
the, the colonial rule. The co colonizer and the colonized. So they wanted to suppress, the West wanted to suppress uh, the colonized people by saying that you are inferior, that you don't have the knowledge. So this kind of uh, distinction was very much uh, presented in uh, as uh, many of the uh, Western uh, philosophers argue, that uh, modernity is a result uh, it produced were not good. Because uh, rationalism, is said, it said, uh, is something very beautiful and it is something which is remarkable and which can, once it uh, is implemented, then the entire world will change, but did not happen. In fact, uh, modernism has reduced uh, human beings uh, to a mission so man is reduced to mission. So industrial revolution did not give a solution to human being. So we have to see the context in which uh, modernism has emerged. And uh, that is the reason why Gandhi felt that modernism cannot uh, solve many of our problems. So the only alternate model is uh, the Swaraj, which is a uh, self-mastery or the self-rule. So the self-rule alone can uh, bring out uh, a, a radical change in the life of uh, uh, a human being or human society. In fact, I would like to quote Sri Aravindo. Uh, he says uh, that in the, uh, he wrote this in the year 1907. He says, I quote him, if we do not uh, uh, free ourselves from the foreign rule, Swaraj is meaning, uh, meaningless. I am afraid we the 30 crores, at that time it was 30 crores, 30 crores of people will become extinct if we don't practice Swaraj. Swaraj is life. It is a nectar and salvation, according to Aurobindo. Swaraj in a nation which gives a breath of life. So many contemporary philosophers have emphasized the significance of uh, uh, Swaraj. So in this context, we have to see how we can relate it to uh, uh, philosophy. This is my uh, major concern. So I would like to see how Suraj, the concept of Suraj, which has been developed by Gandhi, has a close uh, link with uh, close link with uh, Suraj in ideas of uh, K.C. Bhattacharya. And here, I would like to, as I said in the beginning, I would like to use the cultural model or a critique of culture, which can solve, according to me, many problems that we are facing today. Uh, one, one interesting philosopher, I think uh, all of you know about that uh, great philosopher, uh, the cultural anthropologist, G.C. Pondé. Uh, G.C. Pondé, in uh, one of his interesting books, An Approach to Indian Culture and Civilization, says that uh, there is a need for us to make a distinction between nature and uh, culture. I quote him, whereas nature has no history, culture as value seeking is inherently historical as it is bound up with a social and symbolic tradition within which uh, its dialectical and development process are operated, unquote. So, what is the significance of this statement? That uh, J.C. Pandey tries to argue that India, which is a great nation which consists of a rich tradition of ethical values and cultural background, will always see the means and end together. In India, we see the plurality of culture. It always appreciates each and every culture, whether it is small or big sharing each culture its due. So culture adopts itself to the situation. It takes into account the changes that are taking place outside. It is slow but steady. So culture unites men into one cultural group. The development of many culture is due to various causes uh, like uh, physical uh, habitants and then resources which are outside and possibilities inherent in various uh, uh, areas of activity which are inner. So, which means the inner and outer approach uh, is very much essential, uh, which play a dominant role in shaping the nature of uh, culture. So, this uh, approach to culture will help us to understand 
that culture is the guardian of the people. Culture endorses people with uh, their identity. And uh, Pandey emphasizes that there are various kinds of approaches. At least he mentions three kinds of approaches to culture. A scientific culture, scientific approach, historical and metaphysical. And these uh, approaches clearly show that there is something very much implicit in the culture. In fact, uh, culture has two aspects. One is uh, the core and the periphery. The core of uh, the culture or tradition cannot be changed. It is always permanent. Uh, and when you try to change the core aspect, then it no more exists as culture. But on the periphery, you can make certain changes or uh, you, we have been making some changes in the periphery. So this is uh, uh, OK. But uh, if we simply follow the culture without questioning it, without uh, allowing us to uh, modify or re-modify, or without allowing, uh, allowing some changes in that, then we are identifying culture with orthodoxy. That is, uh, the culture and uh, orthodoxy are not opposed to each other. Orthodoxy is a term which is used by many philosophers in order to show that we cling on to the past without questioning them. But uh, we should understand the fact that India lives in two or more conceptual worlds. One is uh, we follow the great traditions which have been handed over to us by the mythological past, which helps us to grow in the future. And secondly, the modern science and technology, which has been playing a more or less role in the development. But India is trying to uh, strike a balance between these two. One is it follows uh, the ancient uh, values, which are very much essential. At the same time, we also allow to accept uh, uh, the uh, changes that are taking place through science. But what we need is we have to develop alternate world views. This is what I would like to say. We want to develop alternate world views, alternate metaphysics for the basis of uh, uh, technology as which means there is a need for us to revisit uh, the culture as philosophy and also the methodology which we have been adopting. So what does this mean? This means, this is what I would like to state, uh, how one can revisit uh, or re-modify or uh, reinvent uh, the cultural base of our country. So this means we must re-examine our cultural heritage and tradition in the life in the light of our present situation. So tradition is always hermeneutical and accommodate some new interpretation and understanding. So it doesn't mean that simply we have to accept the culture as it is. Wherever necessary, we can say, we can make certain amendments or changes so that it can suit our purpose. So that is the reason why I'm using the hermeneutical concept as in the case of uh, Jail Mehta. And uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, tradition is always hermeneutical and it accommodates a <coughs> new interpretation and understanding. This uh, reconstruction means the reconstructing the present categories of uh, knowledge. Man's mode of being in the world helps a person to evaluate a tradition. So we must be in a position to evaluate our own tradition. So it is not possible for a person simply to follow the tradition but he has to evaluate or revisit the tradition. The world of historicity will have an impact on the tradition and it accepts evaluation and reinterpretation. This does not mean that we are revolting against the tradition, but interpreting them in the context of present historicity. The cultural world which one belongs to allows a radical interpretation of the tradition. This sort of interpretation teaches a way of looking at the tradition afresh from a new perspective, which will suit for our present situation. And this explains how a particular person is placed in the surrounding world or tradition, though his physical world is supported by scientific and technological society. So every man is placed in a particular tradition or culture, which cannot be avoided. So this means we need alternate ways of uh, thinking. For example, philosophers, the futurists, others, and others who are interested in the future of technology and thus with the future of culture would be beneficial 
by a dialogue with the alternate world of uh, Indian culture, in which alternate base of uh, knowledge and life can be evolved. So the Western or the technological society is based to a great extent your qualitative or instrumental values. Now they have understood their mistake and now they are turning towards India, wherein we talk about uh, uh, a life which is uh, full of uh, values and ethical principles. So our mode of understanding the human values, which is uh, based on our ancient uh, uh, values which are given by our ancient rishis, uh, sages and saints have to be evaluated in the context of uh, the technology as well as uh, the hermeneutical tradition. Now the West is now in search of a quality of life, quality of life, life like that of uh, India. It has understood the emptiness of the quantitative approach which uh, they have been following. So this uh, mode of understanding in fact helps us to understand the traditional values and culture which has been playing a very important role. So this uh, approach, I would say, is uh, the philosophy of culture, which is uh, reinvented uh, or revisited by using hermeneutics as a mode of uh, understanding. And tradition, as I said, is always hermeneutical, and it always accommodates some new interpretation and understanding. Here, I would like to uh, quote uh, uh, the text Bhagavad Gita, for example, uh, there should be uh, or there would be different ways of approaching the Indian tradition, but the inner meaning should not be lost. This is very important. You can approach the culture by using different methodology, whether it is a hermeneutical methodology or the post-modern uh, 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 understanding of culture. All these are fine. But the inner meaning of culture cannot be lost. For example, uh, this is an example given by Professor, late Professor Suresh Chandra. He says, a text like Bhagavad Gita has different approaches. It is said that according to Gandhi, Gita is a move in Dharma, that is a move in religion and morality. But for Bakim Chandra Chatterjee, Gita is a move in history. You see two different approaches. In other words, Gandhi never placed Gita in the history, whereas Bankim did. For Bankim, Krishna was a historical person and Mahabharata was a real war. But Gandhi believed that this sort of understanding would deprive, deprive the Gita of its status as a religious text of the Hindus. The question whether the text is historical or religious one is not very important in this context. What is important is the truth conveyed by the text. Ban Kim tries to emphasize the fact that his historical interpretation would substantiate the truth, namely the text has some purpose for which it is written. Then this means whether it is a historical or a religious, a text which has some sacredness in it must be understood by the role it plays in the life world of the situation. Similarly, the mythologies must be interpreted in the life world situation because they cannot be dismissed as something nonsensical, which many uh, um, many people are doing. I don't want to mention the name. The stories mentioned in it need not be true, right? But the inner meaning which is conveyed must be understood to preserve the tradition. One who, in fact, uh, uh, long back, uh, Shankara, uh, 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 quotation I would like to quote, he says, Shankara says, one who does not know the tradition, even if he is well versed in all the sciences, is to be ignored as a fool. This is what Shankara says. Similarly, Jawaharlal Nehru says, today India swings between the blind adherence of her old customs and a slavish imitation of a foreign ways. In either of these, can she find relief or life or growth? True culture derives its inspiration from every corner of the world, but it is homegrown. This is very important. The last word is very important. This is what Jawaharlal Nehru says. Now, let us see how we can extend or we can apply this uh, in philosophical uh, debate or in the philosophical discourse. This is very important because as a student of philosophy, I feel that the concept of Swaraj should be 
applied in the philosophical discourse because we are quite often uh, uh, mesmerized, I would say, by the Western tradition or the Western uh, methods of doing philosophy. So philosophy consists of reflection of man's experience in relation to himself. This is how one can define philosophy. But a reflection to one's own experience is based on what type of philosophy one is subscribing to. This is very important. What type of uh, philosophy is one, one is practicing or subs subscribing to? By type of philosophy, we mean whether one is rooted in one's own tradition or borrowed tradition of the West. If a person develops his reflection on a borrowed tradition, then one must see how far this will help. Can we simply ignore our own tradition and adopt the tradition which is completely alien to us? Professor KCB's uh, statement is very important. In his article, Swaraj and Ideas, he says he makes a distinction between the cultural subjection and cultural assimilation. He explains the dangers of cultural subjection and argues that it is a suppression of one's own traditional caste of ideas, which I mentioned already. And he says that it is high time for us to come back to our own philosophy. That is, he says the need to make our own distinctive estimates and evaluations of foreign philosophy. Most of the time, we are simply carried away by the methodology which is adopted by the foreign philosophers. Well, uh, he also rejects, KCB also rejects the hybridization of ideas and patchwork of ideas of different cultures and suggests that one need not accept the foreign valuations or appraisals of our own culture. This is what uh, I meant when, when I was uh, reacting to Professor uh, uh, Pierre Butzer's uh, uh, presentation that how you know we uh, Radha Krishna, for example, used uh, wherever necessary, comparing it with Western tradition. Of course, that was the need of our. So, okay, what KCB says is that uh, one need not accept the foreign valuations or appraisals of our culture. He was very much supporting the need for translation of all foreign ideas into our native ideas and for thinking in our own concepts. To be able to think productively, productively in our own accounts. He says, I quote him, I quote KCP, we can think effectively only when we think in terms of indigenous ideas that pulsate in the life and mind of the masses. Unquote. The need to return to the cultural stratum of a real Indian people and to evolve a culture along with them suited to the times was emphasized by KCB. And of course, thinkers like uh, Aurobindo and Radhakrishna also express the same idea. Radhakrishna says, we cannot cut ourselves off from the springs of our life. Further, Radhakrishna says, there is nothing wrong in observing the culture of other people. Only we must enhance, rise, and uh, purify the elements we take over, fuse them, with the best in our own. Our philosophical tradition should be the basis of our present philosophical approach. This means we must think in our own concepts and stick to our own idea. It is uh, clear that uh, there has been a call from our philosophers, our own philosophers, to retain Indian identity. This is very, very important, retaining Indian identity and to make philosophy more indigenous. But let us see whether it reflects the views of the majority of philosophers in India and also see whether there is any real need for it. So thinkers like Sri Aurobindo, Gandhi, uh, KCP, and many others have pointed out that there is a need for us to rethink uh, our own philosophy and we have to think in indigenous terms. But there are others who say that uh, this approach is uh, no, uh, not needed and uh, this is not the view that is maintained by majority of philosophers in India. Now let us see which is very important. Now I would like to quote another important thinker, Dean Dayal Obadhyaya, who says 
that we must think of our Indian identity or national identity without which independence has no meaning. During foreign rule, our identity was suppressed and the main problem for this is the neglect of the self. I quote uh, uh, Dean Dayalji, as long as we are unaware of our national identity, we cannot recognize and develop all our potentialities, unquote. So, this is something very much uh, uh, important in the context of contemporary Indian philosophy. Why I am talking about this is, uh, long back, uh, Professor Suresh Chandra uh, wrote one article wherein he said there are three kinds of philosophers in India, right? Three kinds of philosophers who are doing philosophy in India. One is a uh, great philosophers uh, who are uh, Sanskrit scholars who are uh, very good in uh, the text, but unfortunately we are not able to utilize their scholarship because they talk you know, only in Sanskrit, they write only in Sanskrit, and we don't have the competency to understand them. So we are not unfortunately benefited by the Sanskrit scholars. So their, their knowledge is vast, especially in Varanasi, I know that very great uh, Sanskrit pundits, we can sit at their feet and learn and listen to them. But unfortunately, we are not able to utilize their uh, knowledge and scholarship. So this first kind of uh, philosophers in India, according to Surajita. Then he also says there is a second kind of philosopher who write only on Western philosophy in India. One example is uh, uh, Professor uh, R. Sundararajan of Pune University. He wrote only on Western philosophy. Towards the end, of course, he was trying to come back to Indian philosophy, but it was too late. So he wrote only on Indian philosophy. And Suresh Chandra, of course, he didn't mention uh, 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 what's his name? Um, Sund Sundarajan's name, but he says there are some philosophers who write only on Western philosophy in India, and they are not recognized in the West. Please note that. We write on Wittgenstein. In fact, I had the problem. I, I worked on Wittgenstein, and when I was talking in a seminar, one German uh, professor, uh, this happened in Satinilam, Father Alok is there. His name is that uh, professor name is Herbert Herring. He stood up and said, do you know German? I said, unfortunately, I don't know. Then he said, you can't understand Wittgenstein. I said, why? I said, I understood and wrote my thesis and got the degree. Then he said, no, no, no. You have to be rooted in our tradition. That means he says that I must know German and German, not only German language, right? German culture. So, and uh, there were many, you know, that, uh, that uh, what is that? Uh, this uh, kind of uh, partiality is always there. And uh, we are not recognized in the West. So why should we write in the West? And uh, as far as I know, there are few scholars who are uh, uh, well recognized in the West. J.L. Mehta is one, of course. And uh, J.N. Mohanty is another, but uh, uh, he settled in foreign countries. So yeah. then there are thinkers like J.N. Mohanty and others, sorry, uh, P.K. Matilal and others, but P.K. Matilal also please note that he taught only in religious department. So, unfortunately, that racism is there and they are not able to accept our contribution if we write something on West. So, this is a second kind of philosopher. Then there is a third kind of philosopher according to Suresh Nira. He says, those philosophers who write both on Indian and Western, what do they do? They take the methodology of the West, right, then apply it to Indian tradition and see how rich uh, our Indian tradition is. Because most of the time we have the habit of praising our Indian uh, philosophy, saying, oh, that is great, okay. But you have to substantiate that. The sense that we are in no way inferior to you. For example, there are many methodologies uh, uh, have come. For example, when we talk about uh, Western phenomenology, the Indian phenomenologists have emerged. There are many thinkers like Jayan Mohanty, Professor R. Balasubramaniam, they have been writing on Indian phenomenology. In fact, they argue that Advaita, for example, is a transcendental phenomenology. So this means there is a new way of approaching Indian philosophy. And also hermeneutics. When hermeneutics developed as a new mode of philosophizing in the West in the 20th century, Father Alok knows. So those uh, methodologies were very much uh, uh, appreciated. But if you look at our own Sastra, especially the Prasthanatriyas, we can understand that uh, we too have been practicing this uh, uh, hermeneutical tradition. Only the name differs. Because hermeneutics means interpretation of the text. 
This is what we have been doing in uh, Vedanta. So the methodologies are uh, uh, one and the same. Deconstruction also is very much present in, in, in Indian philosophy. So what I'm trying to say is by following the footsteps of uh, uh, Professor Suresh and the third kind of philosophers, they have been uh, uh, substantially contributing something very important. And uh, Suresh Chandra says this, this kind of philosophers are very much essential because they give something new. Okay. So uh, now, what is the situation or what was the situation some 50 years ago and now? Because here you can see the idea of Swaraj. Because as I said, my idea, my approach is to see how this idea of Swaraj or Swaraj in ideas can be extended to philosophy by taking the methodology of Gandhi as well as the KCP. Now, when Indian philosophy was dwindling under the yoke of British rule and English missionaries with a view to exposing the weakness of Indian thought, this is what many British uh, uh, people have done, especially the missionaries. English missionaries with a view to exposing the weakness of Indian thought and culture and establishing superiority of their own, writing books and translating a number of religion, religious and philosophical works in Sanskrit, a new way of consciousness was created in India. The coming of the European and the establishment of a vast British empire on Indian soil in the 19th century, no doubt, opened a new chapter in the cultural and political history of India. The strong impact of Western culture, religion, education, politics, economics, law and order, its science and technology on our ancient culture and religion, polity and economic structure also resulted in the creation of a void in the life and thought of the Indian of the period. So what happened is that there was too much uh, Western uh, uh, approach so the Indian, a common Indian, was trying to lose uh, his uh, grip, right? So because you now the it, it, everything was dominated by the foreign uh, uh, methodology. So there was a conflict between his, his uh, I mean, common man's traditional values and the alien cultural pattern. For a time, everything Indian was considered inferior before the superior civilization of the ruler. Just as the British market had closed uh, to Indian uh, commodities and self-sufficient village uh, economy was brought to a standstill. Similarly, in the cultural sphere, you can see how Gandhian methodology could be adopted here. Gandhi has applied this Swaraj in the context of political, whereas uh, in philosophy, we can apply it to in the cultural sphere. So I'll read it once again. Just as the British market has closed to Indian commodities and self-sufficient village economy was brought to a standstill. Similarly, in the cultural sphere, the British and the Western ideas came to reign supreme over Indian ideas and a deliberate and systematic attempt was made to cripple Indian ideas. So the Orientalists have made an attempt to revive Indian philosophy. But unfortunately, the Indian that was discovered now, the new Indian, in quote, was Indian seen through Western eyes. The Western-oriented Indian intellectual had their visions colored by the Western world. They began to judge, they began to judge Indian concepts in Western terms. This dynamic uh, civilization of the West began to break the age-old Indian traditions and the ideas. At one stage, it was even felt that the ancient Indian civilization would just be replaced by the Western. This was not a genuine renaissance. In a genuine renaissance, new ideas are absorbed in already living tradition. For example, Kalidas Bhattacharya says, I quote him, what happens in genuine renaissance is that under the impact of some powerful new ideas, people with living tradition adjust those ideas to the tradition. What these English educated Indians did was to understand and interpret the traditional Indian values, Indian philosophy, for that in terms of the ideas that were Western. This is not a real renaissance, says Kalitas Bhattacharya. So, <coughs> Ramon Rai, the father of modern India, emerged during this period, followed by Swami Vivekananda, Swami Ramatirtha, and others 
these western educated indians saw the plight of their own countrymen who were reluctant to leave their ancestral heritage and embrace the alien cultural patterns and values imposed on them so the translation of many ancient sanskrit texts into english by the orientalists and their publication by the clarington press oxford under the general title sacred books of the uh, east help the indians to know the significance of their own their rich spiritual heritage they felt the need to defend it but they also understood the necessity of accommodating and absorbing certain trends of western civilization into the fabric of indian culture without affecting the essential roots uh, basis of the ancient past so this means in order to suit modern conditions they sought to revise their ancient pattern of the thought so they interpreted for example the vedanta text in the light of the ideas stemmed from the west by means of their intuitive experience and offered a necessary ethos best suited for indian mind so the west is a symbol of new age as well as new knowledge to ramon roy and vivekananda roy who had his spiritual roots firmly in the vedanta had a profound knowledge of the great philosophical texts of the west so different philosophical movements were very much familiar to him it was he who had put india on the march towards the progress and freedom so commenting on him swami vivekananda once said a new life enters india with uh, ramon roy there occurs a new moment in the history of india and there is a general struggle in the dormant atmosphere towards self assertion in several fields of life and knowledge so ramon roy found a new method of understanding the philosophical text especially the vedantic text and the translations and the commentaries of uh, ramon roy on the ancient scriptures of vedanta is no match to the commentaries produced by shankara and ramanuja yet in roy one finds elaborate discussion and arguments in the style of uh, ramanuja and shankara so a new methodology has uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, emphasized has been emphasized by ram ramon roy and others so now it is very much essential for us to see how this methodology is really helpful to us so it is very much uh, important to see whether for you that the contemporary indian philosophy has not contributed substantially something for philosophy this is there is one criticism because the, it is said that many of the contemporary indian philosophers why most of the contemporary indian philosophers they have simply interpreted the ancient system and they have not contributed something new but this criticism is invalid according to me because uh, if we take uh, the contribution I'll, I'll i'll quote this passage uh, because um, I'll, i'll just finish in 5 minutes um, it has been it has been uh, argued that after 15th century ad there is no philosophy in india this is one criticism the critics argue that it has uh, produced no new system of thought right or or had created no new philosophical concept most of the indian philosophers were concerned with exposition and interpretation and only few were aware of the need for creative work and it is also believed of course wrongly that indian philosophy ended with the dvaita vedanta the fact that many textbooks on indian philosophy do not go beyond this proves this some hold that the view of indian that the approach of indian philosophy has ended with udayana who lived during the 10th century later part so there are others who believe the contribution of uh, indian philosophy came to an end by the 18th century so there is a need for revival of indian philosophy and the revival of indian philosophy received unfortunately a severe blow from the world war 2 which enabled our indian philosophers through their contact with the america to get uh, uh, new ideas of western philosophy by bringing them into contact with european philosophy and also american philosophy 
So this is a, a methodology which has been adopted by many of our contemporary thinkers. And it is said that uh, it, is, it is asked, the question that is asked, is this something uh, really remarkable? And Mohanty's uh, approach is uh, very important here. Jain Mohanty says, in India, something very basic has changed now. We write in English, not in Sanskrit. Writing in English cannot be simply an external change. It has and will continue to deeply alter our modes of thinking, unquote. This may be partly due to the fact that contemporary Indian philosophers are trying to impress their Western counterpart by presenting an apologetic of their favorite systems of Indian philosophy, vis-a-vis -vis Western criticism of them, rather than Western them. Or the contemporary Indian thinkers were trying to construct their own systems of philosophy, which is based on Indian intuition, but present them in the Western God. So there is a need, I feel that there is a need for us to revisit our Indian philosophical tradition. And if Indian philosophy is to uh, develop further, develop further sense in order to preserve our own tradition, it is necessary for us to examine the Western philosophy also. Because Western philosophy also has to be seen from Indian perspective, which uh, the foreigners uh, fail to do. Indian philosophers should respond to Western philosophical problems. Philosophers of the East and the philosophers of the West must converse, try to understand each other's thesis, and analyze the arguments and evidences in support of them. There are and, uh, uh, scholars who say that in, uh, uh, in ancient philosophical discourse, there are many areas, many unexplored areas. For example, uh, Jayanta's uh, Naya Manjari, Sri Arshas, Kandana Kandana Kadya, they deal with philosophical issues, no doubt. But how much importance is given to this philosophical text? Because most of the time we will be working or we, we, we are concentrating more on the metaphysical part. So attempts have been made in this direction by great thinkers like V.K. Matila, Jain Mohanty and others. So we must be in a position to understand our own tradition before we take any judgment on them. No doubt, Indian philosophy needs a new direction and a radical de departure wherever necessary. I quote with this uh, uh, quotation once again from Jain Monty. There must be many changes, sorry, there must be many things that are not for us, that are, sorry, I'll repeat. Uh, there must be many things, those that are for us dead and only of antiquarian interest. Some again, whose interest is only cultural, but not philosophical, unquote. This means there is a need for us to revisit our Indian philosophical discourse and see how it can answer the best. That's my first observation. And secondly, we have to see wherever necessary, we have to remodify some of our concepts. And if something are not very important, we must be bold enough to reject it. In this way, one can show a new direction to uh, Indian philosophy. This, I would say, is Swaraj in uh, ideas in the context of a uh, philosophical discourse. So I, I would just uh, I would like to start by saying, by saying that these are my my conclusions. One is that in the context of in the broader framework, uh, both uh, Gandhi and uh, K. C. Bhattacharya have given a new methodology for understanding. The Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj, one in the political sphere and another is uh, another in in a cultural and philosophical discourse. So uh, we can apply the methodology of Gandhi as well as uh, uh, KCP's approach uh, in contemporary Indian philosophy and see whether we need any uh, change in the existing methodology. And if it's very, we must be bold enough to. Uh, reject some of the concepts if they are not uh, relevant to us and see how we can update our philosophy. There is no point in simply saying that everything is very much available in Indian philosophy. Of course, everything is available in your philosophy, but you have to present it to the others. That is possible provided you make a, a clear cut understanding or you revisit our uh, your own philosophy. This is very much essential. And also, this is, uh, this is my uh, last pa point that we must be in a position to understand Western philosophy in order to uh, understand Indian philosophy better. 
this uh, what i mean is that this approach would uh, first of all help us to throw more light on indian philosophy and also we can exhibit the westerners that the so called the new method contemporary methods or uh, the reason methods which they have developed is very much present in indian philosophy and it doesn't mean that simply we have to accept the west or whatever that is given in phenomenology or deconstruction no we can we can see how these elements are present that's all we can draw some pa ma parallel and say that this methodology is not something alien to us so this way i think according to me i may be wrong also so this method uh, of approach i think would uh, would uh, help us to grow so with this i thank uh, all of you for giving me Thank you, sir. You really uh, and extensively put the concept of Swaraj, uh, stretching out the fragments from the two great work. One is Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, and the second, Swaraj in Ideas of K. C. Bhattacharya. I hope you all would have been enjoying the lecture. and we are very much benefited by your thought provoking ideas so th thank you once again and now this uh, lecture is open for discussion so please come to the podium and put your question one by one sir, sir please being in your own place sir uh, give the mic 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 yeah towards the end of the lecture i'm quite satisfied though i had my issues the so one of the things which i found it quite tough to digest is this argument all that work is in german do you know german if you say no you have no right to even comment on it or attempt to understand same is true of you know indians who talk about do you know sanskrit no we have no business to talk about anything on veda or anything of that kind i mean i'm intrigued by this kind of argument <laughs> not on this swaraj it is also possessiveness i would say <laughs> anyway now my question is simple if translation is possible what is the domain where translation can be satisfactory all scientific books and the concepts and the mathematical language all that can be translated without much difficulty technologically india is not lagging far behind in fact in it sector it is perhaps doing very well similarly in logic there should be no problem whether it is indian logic western logic as long as you have brain as long as your intellect is all right you must be able to appreciate whether it is indian so have written or in any language it is written if it is adequately translated we must be able to understand what is the problem with epistemology i don't see again any problem sources of knowledge validity of knowledge exceptions or weakness of sources and so on everybody can appreciate it if you have the will what is the problem with metaphysics tell me whether it is western or indian you have the same kind of you know absolutism relativism if you like dualism etc etc so where lies the problem then ethics ethics too can't for example talk about universal ethics same is true of bhagavad gita except the adjustment of terminology here and there duty for the sake of duty how do you derive duty 
from your nature from your ability background so again there is no problem which branch of philosophy has problem then except that i am indian indian is my language you have no right to do my indian philosophy that pride and unnecessary kind of quarrel ego while westerners were ruling us they well imposed their will on us they said we are superior but as a philosopher if you look at their philosophy our philosophy philosophy is philosophy this was the moment in india earlier some scholars westerly tra trained people they said don't call it indian philosophy western philosophy but if you want to name it yes depend on the origin of the philosophy and then name it like we say tamil philosophy or vedic philosophy or north indian philosophy you like you know things of that kind otherwise it has no significance this quarrel that you cannot understand my philosophy is nonsensical i dare to say that thank you good afternoon sir i am divakar maurya research scholar sir as the topic is of your talk was idea of swaraj but uh, idea of swaraj i i am fully agree with the idea of swaraj whether it would be of gandhi tilak or any one but historical facts and instances reflect the different kind of reality gandhi was uh, supporting the swaraj and Uh, was in support but he agreed gandhi and congress was agreed on the term of acquiring a dominion status and on the other hand revolutionaries like bhagat singh and other revolutionaries were asking for total independence so the question arises here whether the gandhian dominion status demand was the true swaraj or revolutionaries ideas were the true swaraj secondly Uh, as you have mentioned about tagore tagore uh, gandhi was on to the fast until death when ambedkar demanded electoral communal electoral gandhi was against it but ambedkar try to clarify it that it is their swaraj and tagore was again the side of gandhi in third stances tagore supported indirectly emotionally and sympathetically with subhash chandra bose but subhash chandra bose was totally opposed by gandhi so historical instances demands today that who was the real swarajist and who was the practical swarajist in contemporary in in contemporary aspect also though we are agree that we are independent today but can government today uh, state can accept full swaraj of a citizen if we raise uh, demand against uh, 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 grievances against the misgovernment misgovernment and injustice the state put us a uh, national security law impose sedition laws also which is of the british british rule british dominance sedition was there so what after the independence of 75 after the 75 years of independence can we define swaraj absolutely and uh, though it's a philosophical discussion but we cannot run from the from this uh, fact that history will one day or other ask us who was the true swarajist and at least who was the near to the absolute idea of swarajist so i want you to please clarify this stand because history uh, though it's a question of history but philosophy must also uh, be in position to answer this question thank you so please uh, you all are requested to give uh, put the pointed question so once uh, all questions are collected and then sir will answer one by one so if you have any may i ask question, you put it may i ask question and uh, alok tendon sir is there online 
Yeah. So he will uh, ask your question, please. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Panish Shalvam, uh, for giving a very good discourse on KCB Swaraj and Gandhi Swaraj, which I was looking forward to for so many months together. I, I, I thought myself working on that, but I couldn't. But thank you very much for bringing me this, this very uh, important uh, issue before us and the difference between the two. Now, I think you have not highlighted the difference between the two. Because I think this uh, this whole idea of Swaraj and Gandhi, the methodology he uses is very, very much different from what you were saying. Because Gandhi accepts the influence of Tolstoy, Ruskin, and, and Thoreau. And his definition of Swaraj is not only rule over oneself, but rule by our own people. So the second part, the political part, first part may come from our own cultural heritage, but the second part comes from the his uh, influence of influence on him of Western ideas, what you call Western. So I think the methodology Gandhi uses in his concepts, even in Sodesi, Satyagraha, and what take for instance Ahinsa. The Ainsa concept of Gandhi is not truly, truly Indian, Jain, Bodh, or any tradition. It also belongs to Tolstoy and Christianity, where it becomes a, a mode of social action, resisting the violence by the non-violent means. There is no example of this type of thinking and action in our own civilization of thousands of years. Now, this is simple an observation. I will come to a very precise question. That the question is, when you talk about core of culture, what is that? You quoted uh, that Pandeji. Uh, once you accept the core in a culture, then your whole idea of historical and hermeneutically interpreted culture vanishes. And if we have to stick to our core of culture, so there seems to be some contradiction in this understanding. Again, when you accept the relationship of culture to philosophy, then as Professor Bhatt has pointed out, the philosophy becomes culturally related. Then how can we have a claim of universalism in philosophy? There will be always be Indian, Western, and German, and all these philosophies, and they will be relativistic. Easily say that it is the truth and we will not be able to decide which one is valid one. Now the last question I would like to point out that the whole idea of nationalism and national identity is also a western concept and Deen Dhyal Upadhyay when claiming that India needs a national identity I think he is very much cut off from the Indian tradition. Thank you. Any more question? Kumar Chattopadhyay, please ask your question. So please continue. Unmute yourself, Kumar Chattopadhyay. Uma, Uma Chattopadhyay. Uma Chattopadhyay, if you have any question, you have raised your hands. So if you have any question, then ask. Unmute yourself. So we will take, meanwhile, we, we are taking uh, the question of Rajiv ji. Firstly, thank you so much, sir. I have a couple of queries. Firstly, is about the machine-man relationship in this era. When you when we claim that it's a machine man relationships and we argue regarding this. Uh, I think uh, if we take the position, a philosophical position like this, that a man may not be a machine, rather a machine is machine may be a mass man. And as you know that uh, a man are becoming machine or making machine, making machines for their uh, Huge, which is going beyond their limits. So, uh, what is the metaphysical semantics of this claim? 
secondly when we argue about uh, argue about or the further extension of this is that i can take a position for a philosopher nothing is new everything is hidden here and there and uh, that has been uh, that has been discovering and invest, inventing understanding intellectualizing and philosophizing so according to the historical approach you stated that human cannot survive without machine or technology technology and the human mind is technical in character and uh, uh, mechanically nurtures by itself but when a uh, uh, people of this era are interesting uh, interpret the machinery uh, mechanism of mind that we merely articulated as material mind uh, it is not able to uh, internalize and not able to understand the continuity of the same thing as a different forms so what's your position thank you sir please come dr rahul ji thank you so much sir for your really engrossing talk uh, i have a couple of queries uh, first is related with the question of hermeneutics that you have uh, talked about in your beginning uh, so when we actually attempt to interpret any text right now it will certainly be a interpretation or understanding of that text from our own time and context right but though you uh, emphasize then in the very attempt of interpretation uh, the inner meaning the inner core has to be protected uh, but the, here i would like to bring roland barthes which which has talked about the death of the author uh, and i think towards uh, this post modernism and deconstructionism uh, uh, people are increasingly talking about that this interpretation uh, would be a kind of attempt from the individuals where uh, uh, keeping yourself in the center of the original intended meaning of author is completely displaced and that is not the task of uh, the philosopher when we are actually interpreting so how would you uh, respond to this question and next i think which uh, uh, dr tandon has already asked uh, whether we should really uh, keep this distinction of indian philosophy and western philosophy when we are doing philosophy for philosophy it should be the issues which should bother us it should be the the challenges of our time which should really uh, exercise the philosophers mind and they should engage in reflective uh, exercise rather than uh, we should talk about doing indian philosophy uh, to respond to what western philosophers are doing so this is uh, another question and third is that this idea of swaraj that you have talked about can we really have the idea of swaraj without subscribing the elements of the project of modernity because the idea of democracy which is uh, inevitably linked with uh, this enlightenment project or more have actually swaraj or the self rule where the individual perspectives or the interests are not taken into account and then another is whether in the globalized world we can really constrain ourselves to have a uh, fall within the nationalistic uh, territory territorial concerns why because now you have become inevitably part of the globalized world now you cannot have a kind of swaraj where you are not responding to the uh, international concerns and this could be also seen like uh the kind of tension that we can that we can see between individuals and society so uh they are not completely opposed to each other rather they should be seen in a sink that individual interests are not completely against the uh, the interests of society and society should also not be seen as completely opposing the individual interests in the same fashion uh the single or individual nations can be also put across the board of uh other uh, nationalities and that is where we can also think of the possibility of true swaraj so i would like you to reflect on this thank you sir now i think uh, we have enough 
set of questions. So it's time to answer, sir, please. So Uma Bhattacharya ji is Uma Chato Padhaji is there online. So please put your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you all, uh, particularly Professor <coughs> Head of the Department invited me to this program. And I was not able to join in many of the programs. Anyway, today I got the chance to join this program, and that is the on which the Professor Silvam spoke. That is very interesting to me, Swaraj in ideas and Swaraj, the understanding of Swaraj. So I am really benefited. But uh, many times, at many points, I think on this Swaraj, and both by Gandhi. And after that, Professor Casey Bhattacharya, they have spoken Saraj in two different ways. But even then, as a scholar was asking this question by, with reference to Shuhash Chandra, I also think in that way, really speaking, do we have any Swaraj now, neither in the social level nor in the this, this cultural level, nor in the political level, we don't have the real democracy now. We lost it. No speech democracy. We don't have any democracy in our understanding and speech. Always we have to guard ourselves. So where is the Saraj? Only the fact that this both Kesi Bhattacharya, Kesi Bhattacharya, what he has narrated is very good. That we are not free in our ideas, but externally we got the courage from the English, the British, but the Americans. But now the question is, we have we have received this courage, but actually not. In the practical life, we are absolutely dependent on others because we don't have in courage in none of the spheres of our life. So this is my question: How to solve that? Very recently, I attended a program where a, uh, this artist from Bangladesh, he was really presenting uh, her program with the identity, identity of ours, that, that was reflecting the Saraj. But a dancer from this Bengal only famous, the, I was not, I and many of us were not able to see it and enjoy our dance program because that is was beyond our culture, tradition, everything. So Swaraj is given to her. This is. And the secondly, what I think that Swaraj in ideas you are taking into consideration our culture. The question is that what do you mean to say a culture? It's not an opaque term. It has definite meaning culture. What are the different areas? What will be included by the term culture? So these are two questions and my observation. But what you have narrated, Professor Silva, fantastic. Very good. Very clear presentation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I thank all my colleagues for uh, raising some important uh, issues, uh, which uh, definitely would uh, make me to rethink some of the concepts at least. I am because I am open-minded, and let me see. Uh, with regard to Professor. Uh, PR but sir, uh, this thing, yeah, this translation is possible. When translation is possible, why not uh, we accept the other uh, uh, philosophers of the West? That, that means, uh, why can't we read uh, 
uh, Heidegger or Sartre or uh, Wittgenstein, what is the problem? The problem, the exact problem that was raised by my colleague, uh, who is from Germany, Herbert Herring, is that there is always the historicity, or once again, of course, he has not used the word this tradition, which is uh, playing a very important role in uh, in 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 the in the in, the, in uh, uh, the text. For example, he argued that when Wittgenstein, when Wittgenstein wrote uh, the Tractatus, he has got a particular historicity and the cultural background and tradition. And in that context, the text has emerged. So in order to know the meaning of uh, the text, one has to be rooted in uh, the German tradition. Of course, I am not, uh, though at the time it affected me very badly because he just snubbed me like anything. And that was some 20 years ago. I was also very young. I, I did not have the capacity to argue with him. I was afraid, in fact, <laughs> because my teacher was also sitting there and he has invited him, so I should not. Uh... So this is, a, this is one way of uh, no, the, the Western mind thing like that. I am I'm, uh, openly saying that the racism is playing a very important role, my dear friends, whether, whether you accept it or not. But we don't bother. After that, I was working uh, on uh, the philosophy of uh, Heidegger and Husserl and all. It, it did not stop me. I didn't uh, close my uh, Western reading with that. Why I'm saying is that uh, the European bias, the European themata, is something which is predominating in the West. But we can also ask, when many of the Western thinkers have translated Many of our texts, Sanskrit texts, uh, of course, they learned Sanskrit, but we have not asked this question, are you rooted in our tradition? That is a, a wrong uh, this thing, but we never, that is, that is India. We simply accept others, but others, especially the Western mind, is not uh, uh, openly accepting others. This is a basic problem. So, uh, I agree with you, the philosophical problems are one and the same. The concept of being is discussed from the time of Plato and it's up to now. So what is wrong in using uh, a particular language, either Tamil or uh, Telugu or uh, Hindi or English or German to understand uh, the concepts? And moreover, uh, when we say the, the distinction, when we make a distinction between Indian and Western, this is only for the geographical uh, uh, division. The philosophy which has emerged in India, we can say Indian philosophy, and the philosophy which has emerged in Greek is Greek. Once uh, Professor Chachanda Murthy asked his question, is there Indian chemistry? Is there Western, I mean, uh, Indian physics? But now we have developed Indian chemistry and Indian physics. So this kind of approach uh, is, uh, we, we need not bother for that. But uh, this is how the Westerners react. That also we have to take into account. And uh, the, the, the bias is always there. Even, even today it is there. Uh, but uh, I don't know what to do. But translation, yeah, the translation is a very uh, uh, good instrument in understanding the Western text. But uh, what happens is when we are translating, I'm just quoting uh, George Gadamer, Hans George Gadamer, who says translation is very essential and important. But uh, in translation, there is, if there is something called transcreation, it is not verbatim translation that is needed. There is always transcreation that is uh, important. That would really help us to understand the other uh, text. Uh, then uh, Yeah, my good friend has asked a very interesting question. 
what is the real swaraj who is a practical swaraj i don't know really i i don't know how to answer you but i would like to state that this approach uh, made by gandhi uh, was essential for that time of course there were two groups who are fighting for indian independence and of course we are we are we revisiting gandhi whether he has silenced uh, the other group is something which is debated now so whether this concept of swaraj has really done justice is a question so whether he is a real uh, uh, he is talking of somebody like Nehru Subhash Chandra Bose and others who are real uh, swaraj that that's a very interesting question but it's very difficult for me to answer that but i would like to see gandhi as a model May, maybe that model is totally uh, wrong now because the later developments clearly show that there is something basically uh, wrong in this model no doubt we simply we don't accept uh, uh, gandhi's uh, hind swaraj fully then uh, my good friend uh, dr alok uh, tandon sir uh, yeah he argued that the methodology of uh, gandhi is entirely different yeah no doubt gandhi was very much influenced by uh, leo tolstoy and uh, henry david thoreau and uh, christianity all these methods so he has borrowed this concept from the west so it is but please note that having borrowed these concepts from the western thinkers or the western idealist eh, he could uh, show how this can be transformed in indian soil how this could be accommodated in, in indian soil that perhaps we can that credit at least we can give it to gandhi then uh, core and core what is core you was asking what i was trying to say is that when we look at tradition the core elements can never be changed on the other hand the periphery that is inner and outer but derida would say there is no inner uh, there is no center but i would like to say here in culture there is one center say assume that there is a center that cent so if you remove that core then the entire the cultural uh, approach or the cultural uh, uh, methodology would collapse so let us assume at least that there is a core element on the base of which the culture is being supported then outside that there is periphery the elements which can be changed for example i'll give one one example uh, our our dress code for example it has changed few years ago or sometime back you know my my parents my my father was wearing dhoti all the time but now i'm wearing pants and shirt so this is this is uh, the outer surface the periphery but the inner values of our culture since i belong to tamil culture i would like to state that cultural values the core element has not the way of worshiping this our ancestor worship for example that is the core element of our culture indian tamil culture so that has not that cannot be separated from me so as long as i exist as a tamilian that core element will be with me always so this is what i would like to state uh, professor uh, then rajiv i have some uh, difficulty in understanding i think i didn't follow you but one thing i want to uh, tell you is that uh, modernity has promised many things this is the view of uh, both indian thinkers who write on modernity and western thinkers like uh, charles uh, uh, taylor and many others like many spoke on that what modernity did was instead of of course he has done lot of good things but we are concerned about the bad things which modernity has produced and mahatma gandhi is picking up those evils of uh, the modernity it has given a wrong direction it has reduced man as a machine and it is said that rationalism can solve all problems but rationalism on the other hand has not solved the other problem that is the reason why the postmodern is say that this concept that rationality has to be replaced or revisited and all that one so the methodology is something uh, wrong with the, the uh, which uh, the modernity has practiced then um, uh, raghul has, has asked many questions 
let me <coughs> try to answer him. Yeah, the hermeneutics of the text, the time and context. You are right. You are quoting uh, Roland Barthes. Barthes would say that once the author writes the text, he immediately dies. That is not the physical death. That means the author has no control over what he has written. The text comes to me, that's all. We can interpret the text. So no text has some uh, meaning that is fixed. I agree. The meaning which is fixed can be replaced by the commentators. I don't know whether you are following me. The commentator has a more role to play than the author of the text. So this means the author, once he completes the text, that text comes to me, then I am a commentator or interpreter. So I give some new interpretation. But, but at the same time, so this is what we call the intention of the author. The intention of the author can be transcended. It has to be transcended, no doubt. But at the same time, when I say in the hermeneutics, the core element has to be preserved. When I am interpreting an Advaita text, for example, take Advaita Siddhi, for example. When I am interpreting it, then I can give only the Advaitic interpretation to the text. This is what I would call the core element which is present in the text. So I cannot give a, a Dwaitin interpretation for an Advaiti. So if I do that, then I am committing what is known as the hermeneutics of violence. So that is not allowed. So you can interpret the text, no doubt. You have every right to uh, interpret the text. You have to, in fact. And moreover, the text cannot have a permanent meaning. It changes. It is an open-ended one. Always it gives some new meaning. So the historicity the culture, tradition, all these play a dominant role in shaping the meaning of the text. So no text has a permanent meaning, but the core element of the text has to be retained. And then, uh, so this one thing. Then secondly, the distinction between Indian and Western philosophy, I, I was answering Sars question, that Indian, the distinction, of course, is essential in the problem, philosophical problems, as I said just now, are one and the same. But the how you approach, because every philosophy emerges in a particular culture. The cultural background is very important. So when we are uh, uh, analyzing a philosophical problem, in fact, B.K. Matilal says, it is very interesting to see how the same philosophical problems give different answers to the different uh, context. Why? Because the culture, as well as uh, at, uh, the time, the tradition, all these play a dominant role. So the problems are one and the same, but we can also get different answers. This is, this is where uh, the contribute, uh, contribution of philosophy lies. And thirdly, uh, thirdly, uh, can we have Swaraj without? Yeah, can we have Swaraj without modernity? And all? No. What Gandhi? And the other thinkers were pointing out is that uh, some of the defects of modernity. Modernity has contributed, as I said, uh, while answering um, uh, somebody, that uh, the modernity has contributed a lot, but at the same time, the ill effects of modernity we want to replace. That is the reason why long back um, uh, um, uh, Habermas said it is an unfinished project, which means that uh, there are certain mistakes which we find in modernity. So if they are recorrected or revisited, then modernity can be very useful to us. This is what I would like to say. Then, uh, then Uma uh, Chadobadhyay, Madam. Uh, yeah, this uh, question I, I, I don't want to answer. Uh, she said that we don't have democracy, if I understood her correctly. Uh, then uh, she has asked whether she, we have got absolute freedom. Yeah, you've got absolute freedom, but it depends on how you define absolute freedom itself. Because uh, Saath would say that you, when you when you are condemned to be free, it doesn't mean that you have got absolute uh, uh, freedom. That which is which is uh, which has no meaning. So this, uh, how do we solve this problem? Really, I don't know how to solve this problem. But the 
the values which uh, which uh, which are inculcated in democracy has to be preserved but of course you are you we have different uh, dimensions of democracy uh, dr ambedkar very correctly said that uh, democracy is meaningful even only if uh, the last person also gains his uh, justice so this means democracy for all but whether that is happening in the country or not uh, it, it is a different question altogether so that we have to work all of us must work together in order to have uh, a proper democracy wherein the last man also gets his, gets his justice that is that is a problematic area but uh, we philosophers have to contribute for that that's what we can do uh, this is what i would like to say and i am very thankful to you madam for your kind uh, presence and uh, for asking this wonderful question thank you very much uh, sorry sorry to say one point i am to add uh, in relation to professor tandon's uh, this uh, expressions that uh, philosophy and uh, indian philosophy and western philosophy they are not altogether the same as you have told professor silvam that we sometimes need transcription tra trans uh, transcription or like that not pure paper, simple translation so philosophy when we see philosophy philosophy is a discussion and many of the portions from this indian philosophy are just like in this western philosophy issues issues but as you have hinted the point that this indian philosophy has its own cultural root base and all the philosophies they have their own cultural base and from that base indian philosophy proceeds on it's not only ends to the debate and discussion as we find in locke or hume or buckley or kant or etc but here we have a purpose professor tandon will say that i'm going for the religion I'm not doing philosophy, but the religion. In a previous seminar, I have heard this expression. So I'm a little bit skeptic regarding that. Here, the philosophy is philosophy, but that will be called as darshan. So philosophy and darshan, they are not the synonymous words. They have some difference. Philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of this, um, different art, different philosophy of culture, but darshan of this uh, music, etc., etc. These times we do not use because they are different. They are different philosophy, philosophical discourse we do, but that discourse in time uh, at the time of Socrates or Plato, they had that kind of transcendency, uh, transcendental matter, etc. But now that is there, no, not there. But in darshan, always the final end will be like that for transcending from this uh, situation. Thank you. And the Thank other, you, answer, other answer also I am to discuss later on to you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. So I think there is no further question. And uh, then uh, may I request uh, the president of this session, Professor D.N. Tiwari, sir for his presidential remark please thank you professor balishwar ji respected head of the department of philosophy professor anand misra ji the distinguished speaker professor panir selvam ji in front of me professor rp bhat saab yahan aa jate hain Tandan ji, uh, Professor Uma Chattopadhyay ji, online. My colleagues, uh, 
बागड़े जी मौर्या जी राजीव जी एंड अदर्श एंड माय डियर रिस्पेक्टेड स्कॉलर्स रिसर्च स्कॉलर्स नो वी लिसन फॉर लॉन्ग टाइम फ्रॉम ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेल्व थर्टी टू टिल नाउ टिल अबाउट द वेरी ब्रिलियंट लेक्चर ऑन स्वराज इन आइडियाज बाई ए क्रिटिकल स्टडी ए क्रिटिकल प्रेजेंटेशन बाई प्रोफेसर पनीर सेल्वा इट वॉज ए वेरी क्लियर एंड वेरी कम्प्रिहेंसिव एंड ही हैज रेफर टू नॉट ओनली द महात्मा गांधी व्यू और के सी बी व्यूज बट ऑल्सो अबाउट अदर्स शेयरिंग इन द डिस्कशन ऑन द कंसेप्ट ऑफ स्वराज ही टॉक्ट अबाउट द पॉलिटिकल स्वराज एंड द कल्चरल स्वराज एज वेल कल्चरल एंड फिलोसॉफिकल पॉलिटिकल एंड सोशल बोथ टाइप ऑफ स्वराज ही टॉक्ट एंड गेव हिज ओन कंक्लूजन विथ ए सजेशन दैट इंडियन फिलोसफी नीड्स रिविजन री लुकिंग री एसेसमेंट री प्रेजेंटेशन इफ आई एम करेक्ट actually the meaning of swaraj dictionary meaning is self determination it is the rule of your own it is the governance of yourself by yourself swaraj so means self own rajya means governance so how much you are governed by yourself if you are everywhere governed by others in the family in the state and in the country and in the world so others are governing us on our political financial even philosophical also in education system also ah huh? you know how the cultural dependency cultural uh, subjugation entered in our indigenous culture since our since our governance mogal governance and the english governance so our whole mentality in view of this swaraj is imprisoned by those thoughts ha huh? so we are not able to think as per our cultural swaraj we cannot realize we are imprisoned in our thought in our doing everywhere ha eh? living and doing all are imprisoned and with this imprisoned mind captive of so many thoughts somebody is doing marxism somebody is doing uh other ideologies so western philosophy western ideologies are dominating since beginning since it was in the foreign rule and still it is continuing even if we are free so the discussion on the swaras in this department arranged by the professor anand misra and his colleagues is really a very remarkable one it was needed to discuss though we have the paucity of time and therefore it was not discussed as it needs to be discussed by the scholar like philosopher like paneer sel he might have so many ideas but he has discussed only few i know 
I put two position of your life. One is suppose I say that free fear is freedom and contradiction is truth and subjugation is liberation. Free liberation. And just opposed to it, if I say fearlessness is freedom, your freedom, freedom of who you are. Fearlessness is freedom and independent self-reliance and welfare is the truth of life. And Swaraj is the liberation. The two opposite ideologies I am putting here. Some of you may agree with the earlier position that is subjugation is freedom, uh, liberation because in this world we are subjugated everywhere. We are not free mentally, physically, everywhere we are not free. So we are subjugated by our thoughts also. We are ourselves ruled by in our thinking even others thought not with our own indigenous thoughts. So Swaraj is important to discuss. Swaraj in not only the as Bharanga they say, Swaraj Mera Jeevan Siddha Dikara hai. Gandhi yellow right in the Swaraj. So they have their some weaknesses, but they lead to a way of thinking that was explored by K.C. Bhattacharya, K.C. Bhattacharya, K.C.B. So, one very important thing K.C.B. has written, that we enjoy, enjoy Swaraj in even expressing your ideas in languages. So I should not be subjugated by any language that the speaker is speak, spoke in or that you like that I should speak in English. So I can speak in Hindi also. In which language I feel that I am free. If I do not feel that, uh, that freedom in speaking English or in French or in other, yes, I can speak in Hindi, in Bangla, in Tamil. So this is the Swaraj in language also. But you all were captive of the language is spoken by scholars in English. So even in this respect, you are not enjoying the Swaraj in expressing yourself in your own language. Why so? Because a tradition, not. A tradition that was your own, you have forgotten. And now the use the style of the shirt, bussard, pant, shirts, and the people, advanced people is speaking the languages. You think that this is our culture, but that is not culture. Suppose English persons know that what true Shakespeare means, Shakespeare mean for English persons. But French cannot understand the way, the gravity, the deepness, the English people understand about Shakespeare. Similarly, Kalidas, the Vedas, and our, our cultural texts cannot be understood by the Westerners as you can understand. But the problem is you understand your own things from their perspective, from their ideologies. This is your imprisonment. This is against your swaras. You yourself is not willing to realize swaras. This is how the lecture on swaraj is very important to revive that you are free. Not you are condemned to be free, but you are put in a condition, circumstances, but you are always free. 
realize your freedom. This is your house. So it is sharing on the moral basis, on the moral basis, on the moral con conditions of your own, a sharing of power. On moral basis, on, on moral duties basis, a sharing of power by the individuals without any determination of a state, of anyone, of an ideology or anything. So I share it. power that is not limited to me or, or to, to a state. Or, so any rule, whether it is ruling, ruled by your country's own men or by Englishmen, you, you won't uh, need to be ruled by them. You cultivate your own spirit, as Professor Bhatt says, to a level that you need no outer ruling but your own inner ruling. You cultivate yourself to enjoy your freedom of spirit, to develop your own ideology, not you have made from assimilation not you have met from some great thinker, but it will come out of your own spirit. So doing, thinking, and reflecting on a philosophy, all can be natural, naturally developed only when you feel Swaraj in thinking, Swaraj in doing, and Swaraj in sharing everything. So our philosophy is Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. That is that kind of sharing. That kind of sharing. That if you are sharing me, thinking that by sharing I am dominating him, that is not Swaraj. There is no domination of anyone if you are a practitioner of Swaraj. So if I am dominated by you because you are a great philosopher, that is just uh, uh, disrespecting the Swaraj. So to respect the Swaraj is to respect my own self first and to others as well. So well-being is Swaraj. Your welfare is Swaraj. So this way, I think Swaraj should be thought in and in view of the welfare and well-being, the whole Indian philosophy should be interpreted by you people if you feel that you can do this without being, without having interest in others' thought, but being enriched with others' thought. So, you know, no Indian philosopher, no Indian philosopher has commanded from Indian side on the Western philosophers. But all Indian philosophers also they have made some comments on Indian philosophy from the Western side. Why so? Because you are not intellectually, you are not ideologically realizing Swaraj. So if you feel that I am free from all the ideologies, all the captives, there is no improvement. I leave my cultural self. You know. No. Sometimes you think that rationality determines your ways and your, what you are. But you know, most of the time in India, the cultural speech determines what is your way and how you have to live. Suppose, if I have one or two minutes, Professor uh, Anandi, two minutes only. Only two minutes, I would say. Suppose, you have promised you have promised your friend to go to his house at six but in the way to find that some person got accident and you had to uh, take him to the hospital for medical aid so you are doing that your friend can say that you are immoral because you have not kept your promise Okay, you can say, but you know that from the point of 
being of your sovereignty, being of your freedom, being of realizing Swaraj, you can say that that is for the welfare and that is also my duty. And lastly, I have kept my promise also, though it is not in time, but late. So where is morality lost? If you follow your own Swaraj, you are practicing your Swaraj, I am practicing your Swaraj. This is the this is the world of the individuals in which all are a Swaraji. So there will be no contradiction in your thinking, in your realizing, and there will be a smooth progress towards pure cultural spirit. Thank you very much, sir, for giving me occasion. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for expressing your beautiful ideas about Swaraj. And now uh, I request uh, Dr. Rajiv Lochanji for formal vote of thanks. Firstly, I think to the speaker, Professor Parneer Selvam, sir, for providing so important uh, thought about Swaraj, which is not confined to philosophy discipline, rather it is a multidisciplinary topic. And he creates and cult creates a philosophical atmosphere and cultivated many ways to the thought for our benefit and really we are benefited. And he made some statements or he argued some ways that how the concept Swaraj is not confined to a man, neither confined to a man nor a land. Rather, it is uh, bridges both in such a way where we live together in a uh, in a proper way. In addition to our speaker, the audience contributed such a way putting their view or oh, sorry questions and queries which answered by our speaker and we also found how much the area is expanded and how much we can understand and we can continue uh, the study about it and in addition to the both speaker and the audience our respected Professor D.N. Tiwari, D.N. Tiwari, sir, who is belongs to this department and who synthesizes the understanding of both speaker and the listeners and uh, articulated such a way the concept Swaraj, which is little uh, brighter or we can say enlighten us such a way we found that really it is so important in philosophy and uh, particularly uh, in uh, philosophy of linguistics and la language and also it is uh, very much uh, vibrated topic vibrated topic in philosophy we have to think further and further and uh, I can extend my thanks to the head of the department, Professor Anand Misra, who is continuously doing this kind of uh, activities, which is so much benefit beneficial for us as well as others. Uh, without him or without his permission, perhaps it is very difficult to uh, do and uh, uh, learn more about philosophy. Um, multifarious uh, areas. So thank you so much, sir. And I can thank to the convener of this uh, talk, who is uh, Dr. Baleswar Prasad, uh, the convener and he uh, perhaps 
opportunity for all the speakers, all the audiences, and make us uh, have together to intellectualize about this concept. And I can extend my thing to all the audiences who are from online and offline, those who rigorously participate and uh, make the lecture intellectual, or we can say, uh, make it complete. So uh, now the mic is over to the convent. So thank you all. And now we have uh, reached the conclusion. So you all are requested to have lunch uh, outside this hall. So with the permission of the chair, may I announce to close here and now this program.